uh, and and I think for writers and artists who who feel like they have to accommodate certain certain levels of naivete and innocence and maybe ignorance in order to make their their work known or heard. Um, my advice is to keep working the way you want to work. Let the people come to you instead of stopping what you're going to do to teach somebody something before your own work really starts. Um, let the work speak for itself. Let them come. You're listening to Creative Breakthrough, the podcast that provides you with the strategies to elevate your creative passion to the next level. I'm your host, creative hustler, and chicken wing lover, Shireen Kassam, aka the funny brown girl. And yes, I have an unhealthy obsession with chicken wings. Now, get ready to flex your creative muscle and keep winning. Hey, 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 welcome back to another episode of The Creative Breakthrough. I am your host, Shireen Kassam, a.k.a. The Funny Brown Girl. Hey, if it's your first time tuning in, thank you so much. And if you've been tuning in multiple episodes, I can't do this without you. So from the bottom of my heart, I am so grateful to you all. Hey, big news. We are trending at number one in Zimbabwe. Hey, what's up, Zimbabwe? I like to think that it's when I visited Victoria Falls in Zimbabwe this past April. I think it was March, March, April or May. I can't remember. Um, I love some magnets in Victoria Falls and hopefully somebody saw it. And now we are trending at number one in business and number two in careers. So thank you, Zimbabwe. Hey, if you know someone who is a creative or wants to pursue their creative passion and needs some inspiration, motivation or strategies to win, please share this episode. I've started this new thing where I am now filming parts of these um, opening monologues and putting them up on YouTube. So feel free to check it out at youtube.com forward slash funny brown girl. Also, next month, we're going to talk to Jeff Friday. Jeff Friday is the founder of the American Black Film Festival. You have probably heard me talk about this festival all the time. And if you are a creative, whether you are a host, a comedian, a writer, a TV writer, a screenplay writer, Whatever you do, acting, they have competitions for all that stuff of American Black Film Festival. So check it out at abff.com. But I will be talking to Jeff Friday. So if you have any questions for me, send them my way at hi at funnybrowngirl.com. Hey, today I want to talk to you about creativity and a full-time job. One of the questions that I get a lot is, Shireen, how do I pursue my creative passions when I work a full-time job. Like there's just not enough time in the day between going to work, going to the gym, taking care of my family, being in a relationship, being with my significant other, being with my children, grocery shopping, taking the car in for service, like all this stuff. Like when am I supposed to find time to pursue my creative passion? And it is, it is a very valuable or valid question because it's something I struggle with as well as a creative with a full-time job. And I actually posted a video a couple days ago chronicling chronicling. I probably should have named this segment something different than a word that I couldn't pronounce, but about my time as a stand-up comedian and the sacrifices that it takes to pursue one's passion. I'll drop that link in the in the show notes so that you can see what I'm talking about, but um, I've had actually a few uh, interviews so far on this podcast, Creative Breakthrough, where we do talk to creatives who do have a full-time job. So for example, just last week and this week too, we're going to talk to Maza Mengiste, the internationally best-selling author of The Shadow King. And she talks about how when she started writing, and even now as a writer, she has a full-time job. And she had to learn to carve out time in the mornings. And that's what worked for her. She carves out about an hour before work, before she heads out, just to write. And it helps shape her whole um, our whole week, because she even says it in the podcast, like she stopped going out late. She stopped getting drunk with her friends because she had something really exciting that she wanted to do in the morning. And that was to write. So there, when there's a will, there's a way, and you just have to figure out what works for you. Like for example, getting up early in the morning to write does not work for me because that's when I need to work out because I can't do that when I get home from work versus she probably does that some other part in her day. 
We also talked to JP Lambiase, who's a YouTube personality a couple weeks ago, and he talks about how he was at a job where he had gone into a level where the job was kind of running on auto run. Like it was kind of just going, he knew what he was doing, right? It had gotten a little too easy for him. And that's when he started working on learning how to use his camera and learning about lighting and production. And he started his YouTube channel while he was working a full-time job. And then he had to make a decision. Is he going to stay at his job or is he going to continue making YouTube videos because his manager didn't like him doing both? And so sometimes that's a decision you're going to have to make as well. He was in a good situation though, where he was at a great job where things had just gotten easy for him. Um, but he did make a conscious decision. Was he going to stay in that easy job so he could pursue his passion and his happiness or was he going to go find something new? And so you saw the decision that he made in that podcast. We also talked to Tisa Hami, who was an internationally touring stand-up comedian. And she has two degrees. She has a bachelor's from Brown University and a master's from Columbia University. And she chose to go work at a company, at a job that just gave her more flexibility to do comedy. So again, she made a decision that she needed a full-time job. She needed benefits. She wanted the 401k. She wanted that structure, but also a company that would allow her to do stand-up comedy. And so sometimes you have to decide like, What's important for you? Is your career important for you or pursuing your passion? Because it is possible to do both, but you have to prioritize what's more important. And I'm going to get to that in a second. Another person that we talked to was Shireen Lada. And Shireen Lada is, uh, has a master's degree as well. She has an MBA and she pursues a really, really great position in advertising. She's She's been named one of the most strategic advertisers in Canada, in Toronto specifically. And on the side, she runs a YouTube channel. She's a dance personality, and that has over thousands of subscribers. I should have looked it up, but I think it was 220,000 subscribers. And she does both of them simultaneously. She actually says that neither one of them is her passion, neither one of them is her side hustle. They're both her career choices, and she makes it work. She makes it work because there's such a connection between what she does in her day job and what she does in her night job. And so it's really important to step back and say to yourself, what do you want in life? What do you want out of your creative passion? Is it a hobby or is it something that you want to pursue more than a hobby? Because if it's just a hobby, you should be able to find the time to do it. And if you can't find the time to do it, then again, that's okay because it's just a hobby, right? And a hobby is supposed to be something that you do when you have free time, like going to the gym or playing a pickup game of basketball. But if it's something that really makes you burn inside, makes your heart kind of skip a beat, um, then you've got to make that decision. And I'll be honest with you, I have that discussion with myself all the time because my ego gets in the way. Like, for example, I have a full-time job. I have a corporate job. I have two degrees. I have an undergrad degree and I have an MBA. And sometimes I feel like I'm not using my MBA to its full potential. I feel like at my job, I'm not... Um, I'm not striving for as much as I could be striving for. So let me let me put that in perspective for you. All my life I've had jobs that required me to go to work at 9 a.m. and I would work till 7 or 8 o'clock at night and then I would get dinner and then I would work again until midnight. And that was just my day. And I thought that that was normal. I thought that when you graduate from school, you get into these high position jobs and that was normal. You had to work all the time, 24-7. You had to work weekends. And when I got to Amazon, which was my last job in Seattle, I just couldn't do it anymore because at that time I had already discovered stand-up comedy and I wanted to do it. And I remember going to an open mic and it was like nine o'clock at night and I was about to get on stage. Like the guy said, you're next. And then I got an email and it said, we need you back at the office. Something came up and I had to leave. And I remember thinking, this is not what I want in life. This is just not what I want to be doing. Like I want to pursue stand-up comedy because it fulfills me. It makes up my heart skip a beat. Like when I talk about stand-up comedy, like my eyes light up and that's actually been an issue when I do job interviews, but I had to make a decision. And so I moved to another company and in that company, I get work-life balance. I get to leave at five, five 30. I don't have to work nights and evenings. And if I do, it's like, occasionally, occasionally you work a weekend, you know, like if something's due or something's coming up, but I made that decision. And sure, my ego gets in the way sometimes because I'll be at work thinking, I want to do more with my life. Like I want to be a vice president. I should be the CEO. I want, I can do it. I know I'm capable of doing it, but then I have to scale myself back and say, yeah, but if you went and became became a vice president or CEO, could you still do comedy? Could you still do your podcast? Could you still act? Could you still do radio? Like I have to make that decision and I have made it. I have said to myself, I am okay with where I am in my career and maybe not utilizing my MBA to its maximum or my education, 
but I'm happy and I get to do what I love to do. And so I say that to you because if you are struggling with a full-time job and your per- your passion project, you've got to decide what takes priority. And I know a lot of you probably have families and children that you have to take care of. And I'm not saying like quit your job and go get a lower paying job. That doesn't, that's not what I'm trying to say. I'm saying you could find a job or a career path that probably stimulates you and maybe um, pays you the same amount of money, but maybe the culture is more balanced to work-life balance. And maybe it's not going to advance your career into that next level that you want it to go to, but you've got to make that decision. What's more important to you? Um, Shireen Lada was really good about talking about how she has an open relationship with the people at work. So they're aware that she does something at night. And I think that's super important that you have those open communications with your management team so that they know that you're not just going home and watching TV. And that's why they can ping you and email you and call you because they think you're not doing anything else with your time. And I think a lot of times that's what happens. These people at the top think that we just go home and like sit around with our families and play board games. And some of us are like, no, that's not what we do. We actually have a life outside of work. Um, so Shireen Lada talks about that. Actually, another person that we interviewed on this podcast was Abi Verghese. Abi Verghese also has an MBA. He got his MBA. He started working at Unilever. You know that that was a really tough grinding position post MBA. And he went in every day. He did his job. And then after work, he started filming a YouTube series. And then that became Brown Nation on Netflix. And then and that became Metro Park on Eros. And that's how he started his career. He took his evenings outside of work and worked on his passion project. And then that became his full-time role. So what I'm saying to you is it's not going to be easy, but you've got to figure out how to carve out that time. So like, for example, one thing that I do sometimes is if I know my evening is full, like I have to go to prayers or I have a show or I'm going to meet up with friends because you also don't want to miss out on those opportunities. I'm not saying you're supposed to cut out everything in life. Um, I'll carve out my lunchtime because a lot of times at work, we get an hour for lunch and everybody goes out for lunch, right? It's like a time to hang out with your coworkers and let loose and relax. And I'm saying, not saying don't ever do that. I will do that, but I don't need to do that five times a week, right? So one day a week or two days a week, I carve out that time and I go to, uh, I go to a coffee shop or I go to Panera's and I sit there with my laptop and I do my work and I try to see what can I get done in that hour, hour and a half time period. So you can find those times in your days, especially if you're a salad employee, you should be able to figure out where you can be more efficient and where you're able to find extra gaps of time to work on your passion project. So I hope that kind of helps you. I would really, really encourage you to go back and listen to the episodes on the Creative Breakthrough podcast of Shireen Lada, JP Lambier, Tisa Hami, Abhi Verghese, and just hear their stories, even Maza Mengiste, which comes out this week. Hear their stories, hear how they've been able to balance a full-time job and their creative passion because every story is different, every journey is different, how we pursue our passions is different. Sometimes it works to carve out an hour a day, sometimes it doesn't work to do that, and sometimes it works to carve out the weekends instead. And so you've got to figure out what works best for you. But I highly, highly say utilize your time. Like sometimes if you start tracking, just track for a day, track how you spend 24 hours and you'll see like you spend some, you spend a lot of time like on social media, Instagram, Facebook, you spend a lot of time watching YouTube videos, even watching TV, or even when you're traveling, like I have a 30 minute commute to work and like a 45 minute commute back from work. What could I be using that time for instead? Instead of, and Instagram actually does it. Instagram will now tell you how long you've been on their site for. See if you can cut all that back using your commute time. to listen to podcasts, listen to how to videos, listen to other other, other things that interest you that can help you push your passion forward. And you'll just start to see like, once you start utilizing your time better and you have a better understanding of your time, you'll see that it's, it's possible to pursue your passions. And I wish you guys all the best of luck. Email me if you have questions or even thoughts, or you can tell me how did you pursue your passion with a full-time career? Let us hear it so that we can share it with our other listeners and let maybe somebody will get some inspiration from how you've been able to balance your full-time career with your creative passion. Hey guys, it's Shireen Kassam. Now let's get ready for this week's guest. This week, we are back with Maza Mengiste. Maza Mengiste was born in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. A Fulbright scholar and professor in the MFA in Creative Writing and Literary Translation program at Queen's College, she is the author of The Shadow King and Beneath the Lion's Gaze, named one of The Guardian's 10 Best Contemporary African Books. Her work can be found in The New Yorker, Granta, and The New York Times, among other publications. 
In our first part of our chat with Maza, we talked about working in corporate America, making moves to find your real passion, and whether an MFA is necessary. We also talked about discipline and time management and much more. This week, we continue the conversations and talk about Maza's journey as a writer in her new book, The Shadow King, which has been named one of New York Times' 100 Notable Books of 2019. So, what are we waiting for? Let's get started. And during all those years, how did you stay motivated? Like, how did you not lose interest or lose sight of the finish line? You know, um, partly I was excited about the story that I was writing. There were days where I was frustrated and unsure about um, whether I could do it or whether I would finish. But then I would write maybe a good paragraph or I would read a book where I'm, I'm looking at the way that a writer is moving across the page, the way the ideas are unfolding, and it would inspire me. And when, um, when I found a writer, when I found a book that inspired me, then when I finished that book, I would go pick up the next book that they wrote. So I was reading for inspiration and for education at the same time as I was writing, and those two things seemed to work together well for me. And one kept me going. Uh, I mean, the books kept me going. The conversations I would have with friends would keep me going. Um, and, and then the things I wrote, I could see what needed to happen next. Uh, sometimes I would be excited about the next scene, and that would get me up in the morning. But, you know, it's a slow process, and it also takes discipline. And there were days where I did not feel like getting up, and I didn't feel like sitting down to write. Um, but I would force myself to do it because a writer, this writer, Michael Cunningham, whose book, uh, the novel, his novel, The Hours, was, was made into a film uh, starring Nicole Kidman several years ago. And I remember I went to go hear him at a talk and he mentioned the same thing about, you know, during his writing, writing time, his writing process, there were days when he just didn't feel like writing and he wasn't inspired. And he made a comment uh, that um, he said, but I wrote anyway. And then when I look back at all the pages at the end of the week or the end of two weeks, I couldn't tell which section had been uninspired. And um, that, that was really, that for me was a wonderful motivator that to just keep going. Be, yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I thought I heard the door. But um, just to keep going because it, no matter what, if you put something down on paper, you can erase it later. But just to, to practice that discipline was what was the important thing. So do you do your writing by hand or by computer? I used to do it by computer. But now I have switched and I work by hand and then I will eventually move over to the computer. And I have found that working by hand makes a difference. It, it slows down the process in a very good way for me. It gives my brain time to expand and breathe as, I, as I'm moving across the page. And also another good thing about it is that um, if I don't, if I need to revise, if I don't like something, I can cross it out. I can move to the next page, move to another lower down on the page. But then whatever I've written is there. It hasn't disappeared the way it would on a computer, where if you're editing and you don't like something, you just delete it and it's gone forever. And I've realized that so many of my ideas that I go you know, that have, that have helped me move forward are those that I would have deleted on a computer, but in my notebook, I can flip back and say, oh yeah, you know, this might work here, or this helps me think of something else. So I like that process. Nothing is really gone. Right. Yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah. So I want to go back a little bit. So both your books are about Ethiopia and about war and I'm not too um, informed about the publishing world, but I know like in film and TV, sometimes, not sometimes, there's a big push right now for more 
diversity and for more shows that focus on non-Caucasian characters. Is it the same in the publishing world in the sense that when you were writing about Ethiopia, did people push you away from it in any way because they were they were nervous you would never be able to get it published because it wasn't mainstream? Um, I'm not sure if I don't I didn't feel like people were pushing me away, but I think uh, I think readers or I think that there were people worried that the that it was too foreign. Oh yeah, it you know it, this is a really cool history or whoa you know wow this is a revolution what is that like and um, you know but then uh, there was uh, there was also this um, very subtle not and maybe not so subtle suggestion of well you've got to write it for an American audience you've got to explain every word. You have to really paint a picture of what Africa is like for me before I can begin to understand what the family is going through. And those are the kinds of things that, that I had to deal with. And, and writers from Africa, from Asia, from anything that's not necessarily center, um, we all have to deal with that. There's always that sense that you have to hand feed the reader, you have to lead them gently into the story. And because the world that you are creating, which is your world, is so other and so strange and so startling that the average reader won't be able to understand it unless you lead them gently into it. And I find that offensive. Um, and when I'm when someone says, well, you need to explain more, I guess my thing is, um, aren't we all living in, in, I don't know, literature, literature is, is the one place where we should feel like we can actually jump into something that is different from our world and learn. Um, and I often wonder, I often wonder when they say, well, the reader won't get it. I want to say, well, what reader are you talking about? <laughs> you know, give me that, explain and describe that. And, you know, I've had these conversations with friends and I've had them with, with people who um, would give me feedback on my work that, well, you're really going to have to explain this because it doesn't make sense. Uh, and, and I think for writers and artists who, who feel like they have to accommodate certain certain levels of naivete and innocence and maybe ignorance in order to make their their work known or heard. Um, my advice is to keep working the way you want to work. Let the people come to you instead of stopping what you're going to do to teach somebody something before your own work really starts. Um, let the work speak for itself. Let them come. And I and um, I think about the films that that have been made that have done that that have just they have existed and people have gathered around them. And I'm you know I think about the the breakthrough that Moonlight was. And uh, the, it it what Moonlight wasn't trying to explain something. It was just here you are in this world of this little boy who is gay and you're going to follow him because ultimately this is a story about a little boy who's who is gay but it's a little boy and it's a story about love and friendship and regret and all of these things that anybody can understand and i think um that that aspect of the work will always shine through if the work is good and the work cannot be good if you're spending all your time trying to teach an audience how to understand the work you should be doing. That's an interesting point. So did you, so at the end of the day, did you struggle then? Like, was it hard to kind of bring this book to pe to publishers to kind of say, Hey, this is my story. Um, you know, I was really lucky in that, um, I had an agent who was really interested in in stories in my kind of story, 
uh, who said, I think I know editors and publishers who would be interested in this. And of course, not all of them were. Um, not all of them are. It, that's, it's not, it doesn't really happen that way generally. Um, but enough were interested. And then I had one editor who said, this is my book. This is the book I really want to work with. And that's all you need is that one. Mm -hmm. That's true. You just need yeah. one. Yeah. So your books, like you mentioned, your books are historical, but they're also um, fictional. So how do you, when you're writing a book, like the way the, the book, the two books you wrote, how do you know when, what's the fine line between like realistic or historical and fictional? Like how, when can you cross that line, I guess? Mm. Well, you know, I always remind myself that uh, I'm writing fiction. I'm heavily indebted to history, but really my loyalty is to my characters. And if I run across some historical moment, let's say some historical event, and I can't figure out how my characters will work with that, or it's just jarring with something else that my characters have done, or it doesn't fit the timeline that I've created, then I can work around that by creating a fictional event as opposed to sticking to the historical event, um, if that makes sense. And so I, I am telling a story. I am telling a story set around a, his, a, a historical period, but it's still a story. And the story always comes first. And the first thing I did when writing, um, particularly my first book, was um, to develop the characters, to figure out who these characters were. I have a sense of the revolution. I had enough memory, enough personal history, you know, my family, the family stories, stories from friends. I had a sense of what happened. I said, I'm not going to research right away, but I'm going to write about these characters. Who are they? What do they want? What's happening? Um, I knew I, I was going to have a, a doctor in the family. I was going to have a son who was a revolutionary and another person who was completely the opposite. And I developed them. And then later I said, okay, let me see. Let me do some research and find out what's happening in the revolution. And let me start sticking in some scenes and writing some scenes to mesh with some of the general uh, scopes of the, of the historical event but I'm still, I was still focused on the character, if that makes sense. Hey, it's me, Shreen. Sorry to interrupt. Creative Breakthrough listeners, are you enjoying this episode? If so, I have a quick favor. Could you leave us a review, whether on Apple, SoundCloud, or whatever platform you're listening from? It's a great way to pay it forward and let other creatives know about the show. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Okay, I'll get back to the original interview now. Thanks. Bye. Okay, got it. Yeah, because yeah. it was, I mean, in the beginning, when you start reading it, you're, you, you, it, it's a, it's, um, uh, what's the word I want to use? Like, it's very deep in the sense of like, oh my God, I'm reading a history book, but really I'm not like you, you can see the difference, but it's also like, it was very interesting how you were able to do that. Mm, yeah. Thank you. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks. You always, you, you're learning something at the same time, like you're, you're, you're engrossed in this story at the same time too. Uh, thank you. Yeah, that was, I, I, one of the things is I, I didn't want just facts. I, I, they have to be attached to a human being. You know, it doesn't matter that, let's say, um, you know, the president gave a speech. Like it doesn't matter unless my character is watching that speech and something is happening as a result of that. And so, yeah, it has to be attached to the character. Um, I want to ask you really quickly, because I don't want to skip over this, but I know you're a Fulbright scholar. Can you quickly tell us, like, what is a Fulbright scholar and what are the benefits of, of being a Fulbright scholar? Sure. Um, a Fulbright scholar is um, someone who wins a Fulbright fellowship, scholarship. And I applied as um, a grad student. Or just I had graduated, but I know that graduate students can do it. And I believe there's something also for undergraduates, uh, maybe students who are just getting ready to graduate. And what the Fulbright does is that it gives you an opportunity to do research um, 
in whatever field, medicine, humanities, sciences, um, you know, anything like that. Uh, it gives you the opportunity to go to the country that, that is pivotal to your research and work there for nine months. You have, you're paid um, a stipend and you have an apartment. You are given access to whatever you need for your research, whether it's university access or professors or researchers or historians. Um, the Fulbright opens those doors and lets you be in the place that you need to be for, for a, a long, I mean, for a, a healthy amount of time. And I went to Italy to research my second novel. And um, I lived in Rome. I had access to historians. I had made contact with them. The Fulbright office helped me with making contact with other people. I had a mentor and advisor there who helped. And it, it really, it, it made this book that just got published absolutely possible. Uh, but it changed my life as well. I made new friends. I go there all the time. I speak Italian. Um, I'm still connected to that country and to the people there. And I know I will be forever. And so um, anyone who's interested in applying for a Fulbright should check out the website and should think about applying because it was one of the best things, <clears throat> excuse me, it's one of the best things I've ever done. That's awesome. It sounded yeah. like it. Like I was reading an article that you had done about about Italy and just just being able to be so close to the history and the artifacts and like getting the research and being able to really immerse yourself. That just sounds like such a cool opportunity. It was wonderful. Yeah, I highly recommend it. Awesome. Yeah, I've always also wondered what a Fulbright was. I Googled it, but I like didn't totally get it. So thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> So what are the highs and lows of being a writer? Whoa. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, you know, the high is also the low. The high is the – there's a, you have to be alone. You have to be comfortable being alone because you need to be alone to write. It's a solitary task. It is not something like filmmaking where you're working with a crew and, a, you know, groups of people. This is really something only you do. And if you're uncomfortable with that, or if it gets too lonely, that's something to think about. Um, but I like being alone. I like solitude. I like reading. Those are all solitary acts. Uh, but I can immerse myself in a world when I'm, when I'm writing or when I'm reading or when I'm watching a movie or listening to music. And it's, it's that, it's that very individual, um, I don't know, that, that, that sense of, of being alone, but you're not alone because your brain is being connected to all these other different ideas as a result of work or research or the writing or music or whatever. Um, and I like that. But what happens with that is that when you hit, I don't, when you hit a, a wall or when I hit a wall with writing, when I can't work my way around a scene or figure out a character or figure out a plot point, it's just me. And I am, I can be my best champion or my worst enemy in those moments. Um, and it, because it is just me in the chair sitting down with this notebook and we, I have got to figure it out. So that can be really tough. There, you know, there have been days where I've been completely discouraged, you know, afraid that I wasn't able, going to be able to do anything. Um, and then the next day I sit back down at the desk and something happens. I make a tiny breakthrough. It, it leads me forward to the next day. And then when I have a really good day and I've just done something that was so difficult and it actually works, um, that exhilaration is amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that makes it all worth it. <laughs> <laughs> so for aspiring actors, or writers struggling to find their way, what advice do you have for them? Don't give up. I mean, even for actors, maybe for anyone in the, in the creative field, do your homework, do the work. If you're a writer, you should be reading. Um, I read, but I watch films. I just, I, I, the films and 
certain filmmakers really, really feed my writing process. Um, I look at structure. I look at pacing. I look at lighting. I'm watching those things on a film, in a film, and thinking about, okay, how do I do this in my writing work? And so the, the approach um, is interdisciplinary for me. I do the same thing with music. I'm, I'm listening to pacing and beats and rhythms. Um, and so I immerse myself in that, but I am constantly reading. And I'm writing every day. Even if it's just in my notebook, it's just an idea, it's just a line that I read somewhere or that I heard somewhere that I really liked, I carry my notebook around and I write things down. So I'm constantly engaged in the writing process. And I think that is my, the advice that I would give to people in the creative arts is um, it's not about being published as much, it is, as much as it is about being immersed in the process and in the world. So don't give that up. Keep moving forward with that. So what's next for you? Well, I'm slowly going to be moving into book three, but mm -hmm. I have um, I have different, you know, short pieces that that I have coming up. I'm I'm working on those now. So I it's I, I've been on book tour and it just ended. So I'm slowly getting back into writing and flexing some of these old muscles. So um, <laughs> I'm doing that now and then and then gradually moving into the third project. Awesome. So are you still teaching while you're writing still or? I, t technically, yes, but I have this, uh, this semester and next semester off so I can focus on my own work. Awesome. Very cool. And I yeah. heard your, your book got picked up to be made into a movie. Yes. And that is, I'm really excited about that. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank and you. Thank you. And it's so cool because you worked in the film industry, right? So it's like, was that 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 goes back to you saying like it, it taught you something for this yeah, step in your life? Yeah, it's it's really interesting. So all of a <laughs> sudden, when I'm when I'm talking to the producers, I know what they're talking about because I was involved in that work. Yeah. So this is again, all of these steps are cumulative, and I think that's the thing to keep in mind that you're not in the wrong place. That's it's, awesome. It's just a step. Well, I can't wait to watch the movie. Oh, thank you. Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> what year is that supposed to be 2020 or 2021? Probably not until 21 at least. 21. Okay. Yeah. Hopefully I'll be unemployed, not unemployed, but not in, <laughs> not in corporate America and I'll be able to go in the middle of the day and put my feet up and have some uh, <laughs> That would be wonderful. <laughs> and let me know when you do. That's okay. great. <laughs> so let's All right. Uh, let's jump really quickly into the lightning round. The lightning round, I'm going to ask you five questions, rapid fire, and you just tell me the first thing that comes to mind. Okay. What's the best piece of advice you've received? Keep going. What's your definition of success? Oh, man. Um, <laughs> oh, my gosh. Uh, starting conversations in the literary and other worlds. Who inspires you and why? Uh, my mother, because she never gave up. What's a habit that's helped you on your journey? Oh, my stubbornness. <laughs> what yeah. do you want your legacy to be? Oh, um, that, oh, wow. That's a really good one. What is, what is the legacy that I forced conversations about moments in history that people were not talking about before. Oh, you've definitely done that. All right. Well, I'm done then. <laughs> you are. You, you can retire tomorrow. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Ma Maza, if our listeners wanted to find you online, where could they find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Maza Mengiste. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at Maza Mengiste. And you can follow my novel, which also posts really interesting things, uh, on uh, Instagram at the Shadow King novel. Oh, awesome. Very cool. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. This was thank so you. informative. Thank you, Shireen. This was really fun. Thank you so much. Wow, so much more to learn and so much more inspiration and motivation. 
Key takeaways from Maza. One, force yourself to work on your passion every single day. Two, keep working the way you want to work. Let the people come to you. Three, the story comes first. Four, don't give up. Five, be immersed in the creative process. Thank you guys so much for joining us this week. We can't wait to talk to you again in two weeks. And by we, I mean I. Feel free to stay in touch with me on Facebook at Funny Brown Girl, on Instagram, Funny Brown Girl, Twitter, Funny Brown Girl. Join our Facebook community, facebook.com forward slash Funny Brown Girl. Or check out my YouTube video and see me live and in person at youtube.com forward slash Funny Brown Girl. Now get out there and flex your creative muscle and keep winning. Thanks for listening. Stay connected about upcoming resources, including opportunities, festivals, competitions, and grants to help you grow your creative passion by subscribing to my bi-monthly newsletter by visiting funnybrowngirl.com forward slash subscribe. Don't miss out on a life-changing opportunity and subscribe today at funnybrowngirl.com forward slash subscribe. And hey, if you decide to go on Instagram today, follow me. I'm Funny Brown Girl. I'm Shereen Kassam, and you've been listening to Creative Breakthrough. Now, go flex your creative muscle and keep winning.